this online lecture is on the 18th century. Now, as you can see, there's multiple points of context that inform the art production of the 18th century. We'll start with the style of Rococo. Rococo was primarily a French style, although it did appear in limited amounts in other regions. For example, it had a very strong interior design focus in Germany. The Rococo style coincided with the rise of the French nobility. They were consolidating their power and they were getting richer. This made the current king, Louis XIV, a little bit nervous, and so he devised a plan. He had built this giant sprawling palace called Versailles, which you read about Versailles in your French Baroque reading in your textbook. Fre Versailles was so big that what he did is he had all the nobility, which wasn't tons of people, I mean, there was a small upper class. He had all of the nobility come and he had them live at Versailles. Now, part of this was that the nobility were expected to participate in the government by holding various administrative offices. What Louis XIV decided to do was be kind of like a micromanager, and uh, he took away those administrative duties, took care of those on his own, or at least more directly oversaw them. So what happened is it left all these rich people kind of hanging out together with nothing to do. And what do you think would happen with rich people with nothing to do hanging out together? Shenanigans. That's what happened. And the Rococo style of art was capturing this. We have these depictions of wealthy people that are living lives of excess, frivolity, debauchery. And uh, this didn't really sit well with the majority of France because the majority of France was very poor. There was quite a distinct unequal distribution of wealth in France at this time. And so this behavior didn't go without consequences. People didn't appreciate having to work so hard and to sacrifice and to be barely surviving, uh, preventing themselves from not starving, while the rich are living it up, uh, partying all the time. People began to question this. They began to question a system that allowed for such an unequal distribution of wealth and they began to revolt. Now we don't see in this lecture, in terms of art, anything that's reflecting revolt. We certainly are seeing things that are um, communicating dissent or displeasure with the government, but it's not until the next lecture, our lecture on neoclassicism, that we'll begin to see art reflecting actual revolt and revolution. Now, one of the things that was a contributing factor to this was the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was a new way of thinking, about thinking critically about the natural world and humankind, thinking in ways that were independent from religion, tradition, or myth. Basically, the idea is that people should think critically, do things like use reason, experiment and reflect on the results, and conduct critical analysis. And these thought processes were extended to all areas of life, to the economic system, social order, this includes class structuring, as well as politics. Now, we move on to the classical revivalist style, which is a style that's very much reactionary to the Rococo style. This style, the classical revivalist style, was a rejection of the frivolous lifestyles of the upper class and the royalty, also was a rejection of political corruption, which they thought was endemic amongst the monarchy, and also rejected the idea of the di divinely ordained monarchy, this idea that God uh, himself chose these uh, rulers to um, rule, and therefore you can't argue with it. And we've seen this strategy since the beginning of political rulership, this idea that you know somebody is specifically chosen by God, um, and therefore you can't really you know argue with that. <clears throat> we also, though, can look at the classical revivalist style and see that it represents re revived interest in the classical period, the classical art of ancient Greece and ancient Rome. People associated the classical period, in particular the classical period's political systems, with morality, a strong civic virtue, and integrity. And these were ideas that went hand in hand with the Enlightenment ideas. So you can kind of see what's happening. You have these people, these upper class rich people, who are lazy, they're immoral, and now all of a sudden France is super interested in morality and you know civic virtue and you know, being a good community member and things like that. You can see that these ideas in many ways are reactionary as well. 
And then finally, what we're going to talk about in today's lecture is America. We haven't talked about America yet in this class, because America hasn't existed yet. But existed exists now. We see America emerging onto the new political world stage. So we're going to be looking at some of the earliest American works. And one of the things that I think is most interesting about early American art is that the artwork functions to explore newly established cultural themes. And many of these themes remain re relevant today. So for example, we're going to look at a portrait. And we're going to see that this portrait extols the virtues of hard work. We know that in our culture today, hard work is very important to us. We think that it's sort of the avenue to the American dream. If you work hard, you get good things, you'll be successful. This idea has been around since we as people, America, has been around. All right, let's take a look at Rococo art. So this is a great example for us to start with. This is the departure from the Isle of Scythera by the artist Jean-Antoine Watteau. And the reason why this is a good one for us to start out with is because this painting pretty much has all of the common visual stylistic features of the Rococo style. So this allows me to kind of list for you these features and you can have them together all in one place on your notes. Now I will say this before we begin to list these features. The Rococo style itself actually is considered by some art historians to be reactionary. Now what I mean by that is it's a reaction against, and in this case it's a reaction against the formality, the heaviness, the seriousness of the preceding Baroque style. So the Baroque style, it's um, in certain iterations very like emotional, and um, this is something that is in contrast, it's more light, it's more playful. Now, the visual features of the Rococo style help to contribute to this mood of playfulness and also gives it kind of a whimsical feel. Some of the things that contribute to this are things like loose feathery brushwork. This is very common in the Rococo style. We also have <clears throat> pastel colors. Light pastel colors which are very much in contrast to the heavy dark colors that we tend to see in Baroque style, particularly in the Italian, Dutch, and um, Spanish approaches to the Baroque style. You see a nice sense of atmosphere that's filled with light. There's a sensuality that you see here. To help convey the wealth of these people, as the common subject matter of Rococo painting, again, is wealthy people having a good time, you have figures that are dainty and elegant. One other thing that's common in the Rococo style is very often we see some sort of reference to mythology. Here we see it um, with these cupids, which we know cupids are traditionally associated with love. The Isle of Scythera, which we see in the title here, this also is a mythological reference, Isle of Scythera was a mythological island for uh, representing eternal youth and love. We get the idea of love here, where we have couples that are paired off, cavorting throughout the landscape. This lady fell down, uh, not sure why. Here we have a little bit of seduction going on, so we can certainly see that um, you know, love and all of that business is an important part of the, the theme. Now one other thing, this painting is a type of painting that Watteau invented, which is basically rich people outdoors having a good time. Now we move on to The Swing by the artist Jean Fragonard. This is another really well-known Rococo work. Uh, for those of you who've seen the movie Frozen, I'm, I understand, I haven't seen the movie, I understand that there's a scene that appropriates uh, what we're seeing here, which I find kind of ironic because there is this sort of sexual immoral undertone, so it's interesting that Disney would use that type of imagery in their, uh, their movie. Anyhow, The Swing. So this is another highly typical Rococo work. You can see a lot of the similar stylistic attributes that we saw in the earlier Watteau piece. This is one of the great things about the Rococo style. The um, application of the style is really consistent. And so in my mind, it's very easy to identify a Rococo piece because all of these um, features commonly appear most of the time. So you can see that this is an image that was influenced by Watteau because it is an image of rich people having fun outdoors. Other things that we also saw in Watteau's work, as we see again here, the loose brushwork, feathery. 
we see a really nice sensual atmosphere that's filled with light. This image is playful, it's whimsical, there's a feeling of elegance, the figures are dainty. We even have our mythological reference with our Cupid here, and there are some here as well. Now in this image, and this is actually I think what makes this image a little bit better for us to look at, we do see a reference to some of that debauchery, that immorality uh, that was endemic during this time period amongst the upper class. Now Rococo paintings, they can get pretty, um, pretty intense in terms of depicting sexuality. I'm not showing any of these in these lectures. This is a more subdued example. Uh, we have this old guy who's like using these strings to move the swing back and forth. This woman is swinging. This man has strategically positioned himself so that he can look up this woman's skirt as she swings. She knows that he's doing that. She's allowing him to do that. She flirtatiously kicks her shoe off towards Cupid, who holds a finger over his mouth to say that shh, he won't tell anybody. This is the kind of immorality that the French people were seeing in their in this artwork that prompts them to more emphatically embrace ideas of the Enlightenment as well as the classical period, particularly those that privilege morality. Now this image here, this is a transitional image. What this means is that it has features of two styles in one because it's not like every single artist was one day painting the Rococo style and then the next day every single artist is painting the classical revival style. It didn't exactly work like that. Very often there was a kind of waxing and waning that happens in terms of emerging styles. So like for example in this painting there are a few examples of the waning Rococo style but we're starting to see integrated into the composition um, features of the new classical revival as well. So it's a mixture of the old and the new. Now what I'd like for you to do is I would like for you to take a moment, pause this video, and see if you can identify common features of the Rococo style. I'll give you a hint, there's not that many. So hopefully you did that. Let's talk about the Rococo stylistic features. Um, first of all, we do have the light feathery brushwork. The brushwork is important because this is going to be a point of contrast between the Rococo and the classical revivalist style. They use different brush stroke, brush stroke techniques. Here the brushwork is more lighter and feathery. That certainly is a feature of the Rococo style. We also have a representation of elegance. This will go away in the classical revival style. We have the wealth that we can see in the clothing and in the interior design as well as the furnishings. Finally, you can say that there is some Rococo color usage. Pastel colors. Pastel colors commonly seen in Rococo paintings. We can see this primarily in the background. Now this is not a completely 100% Rococo color usage that we see here. These deeper reds, these would be more uh, characteristic of the classical revival style. We wouldn't see such dark colors typically in a Rococo piece. That's pretty much it that's Rococo. Now let's talk about what makes this classical revival. Now first of all we do have this uh, scene that's framed by classical architecture. We have a fluted column in the background here. I'm not really sure what this is, but it certainly looks classical to me in that it's angular and it's geometric. So that certainly is the classical aesthetic. So those are classical features. The other thing that makes this classical revival is actually the subject matter. We're seeing a type of subject matter that never would have been included in Rococo painting. We know that Rococo painting, common subject matter, is upper class French people having a good time. With the classical revival style, the um, subjects are much more serious, they're much more severe. And what we're looking at here actually is the classical revival theme of the good mother. This is an enlightenment theme as well. And it's this idea that mothers have the particular task of raising young children so that they grow up to be good citizens, good community members, etc. So how do we see then this going, going about? So this is a portrait of Marie Antoinette who at the time was the Queen of France, the wife to King Louis XVI. So we see her as a mother. 
Now, this alone is an interesting choice of subject matter for the artist Vigée Le Brun to paint. Vigée Le Brun was the official uh, portrait painter of Marie Antoinette. Now, traditionally, royalty did not have a direct role in raising their children. The children would be sent off to nurseries to be raised by governesses and wet nurses, and oftentimes these nurseries would be located even in a completely different city or completely different area of the country. So it's very unique to actually see a monarch that is in um, the active role of parenting. And so we see here, um, you know, the, the, the girl, like, you know, holding on her mother's arm, looking up adoringly. There's clearly close physical proximity. They seem to have a close loving relationship. She holds on her lap a squirming infant. Um, and then she has a son here. The son, as you can see, is pointing to this empty crib or cradle. This is an, um, a reference to a child that uh, Marie Antoinette lost uh, recently after this painting was, or before this painting was painted, uh, shortly after the child was born. Now, the idea behind this is to try to position Marie Antoinette kind of as an every woman. And you can see that she's trying to be an every woman with her dress. If we go back for a minute, these are more typical portraits of Marie Antoinette. They're a little bit out of control in terms of like these cr crazy dress that's like huge. You can't even barely move or sit in it. Um, it is just completely over the top in terms of displaying ostent ostentatious wealth. So here she's like, oh, hey, I'm more like an everyday person. She's certainly toned it down um, in terms of her clothing. And she's trying to show, like the other women of France, that she's, you know, an active mother. She also is trying to get a little bit of sympathy from her, uh, her people by making it clear that she too suffers, she too has challenges in her life as she grieves over the loss of her child. Now, this painting is interesting because um, if you consider the time period, 1787, this is actually two years before the outbreak of the French Revolution of 1789. And because of this, it makes it clear that there is a subtle amount of propaganda that exists in this piece, and that Vigée Le Brun's combination of the Rococo and classical revival styles um, are not exactly a coincidence, that actually it helps her to create this more propagandistic image. Marie Antoinette, you may or may not know this, has had a horrible reputation in France. She was seen as selfish, immoral, um, frivolous. She was seen as like this like sex addict and she was like a compulsive gambler. She was seen as completely indifferent to the uh, plight of poor people in France. One of the most familiar things that people know about Marie Antoinette is that she um, supposedly said, let them eat cake. The, the story behind that was that, you know, the French people were rioting, they're starving, they said, you know, we can't even eat bread, and she says, well, let them eat cake. Well, if you can't eat bread, you certainly can't eat cake. Anyhow, I've been doing some research on Marie Antoinette, and I'm starting to learn that perhaps this is not an accurate portrayal of her, that she actually had this really bad reputation, and that was something that the revolutionaries crafted to kind of use her as this image of why there needed to be revolution, why there were so many problems within France. She kind of was like a scapegoat. Evidence indicates that this portrait that Vigée Le Brun painted actually may not be that inaccurate, that Marie Antoinette actually was a kind and nurturing presence in the life of her children, that she was actively participating in raising them and trying to, to be a mother. Either way, the idea is that this painting is trying to help her repair her damaged reputation and hopefully gain favor uh, within the eyes of the French during this time that was becoming increasingly politically contentious. Now this is an example of a classical revival piece. This is pure classical revival. There's no transitional aspect to this. There's no Rococo features. With the classical revival style, as uh, the name suggests, it's trying to sort of revive the classical aesthetic as well as reviving classical subjects. What we're seeing here, this is a um, image of classical history. So this is the mother of Gracchi, and it depicts Cornelia right here, who's the mother of the Gracchus brothers. 
these little guys right here. Now the Gracchus brothers were people that actually existed. They were political leaders who tried to reform the Roman Republic in the 2nd century BCE. How do we have these great men that come around and try to revive, to, um, try to uh, reform the, the Republic, try to do good things for the, the, the political system, which was what France was hoping somebody would do for them. How is that possible? It's possible because they were raised by a good mother. Again, we see another iteration of the Enlightenment theme of the good mother. How do we know that Cornelia is a good mother? We know right here. So we have this lady who's like taking jewels out of her jewelry box and she's showing Cornelia and she's saying, these are my jewels. And uh, Cornelia points to her children and says, these are my jewels. It's a really nice moment. What we see stylistically that's characteristic of the classical revival style, notice the brushwork. It's tight and it's crisp. It's not loose and feathery like the Rococo style. We see in the background we have architectural features that date to the classical period, and we see that the people in the scene are wearing traditional Roman clothing. And now we move on to America. American art. Now we know from our own national history that Americans embraced many of the ideas of the Enlightenment. It was the ideas of the Enlightenment that encouraged us to have a revolution. And France follows suit, and they have a revolution in 1789. The Enlightenment was the inspiration for drafting the Constitution. Many of our ideas within the Constitution, like for example the separation of church and state, are Enlightenment ideas. This is a good example of uh, an American work that does um, offer some, again, specifically American cultural ideas. This is a portrait of Paul Revere, which I did not know that Paul Revere looked so similar to Jack Black. With this portrait, we have um, this very straightforward, very natural approach to portraiture. Now, first of all, I think that there is a little bit of an influence coming from a preceding style that we've studied, not in this lecture, but preceding. Do you think you can guess what it is? If you guess Baroque, I would say that you're correct. I feel, I feel like there's some Caravaggio aspects to this piece. There is some approach to tenebrism, the black background, with Paul Revere kind of emerging forward. There is that Caravaggio naturalism in the sense that we're seeing somebody that's not rich or fancy, but like an everyday person wearing everyday contemporary, for the time, clothing. The only thing that we don't see that we would anticipate in a typical Caravaggio painting is the very dramatic presentation of subject with people gesturing or crying or whatever. So we see then again, as I said, this straightforward portrait. Part of what makes it straightforward is it's so simple. We have a very plain background so that the eye is not distracted and is concentrating on the figure. At the front of the composition in the foreground, it's pretty plain as well, all we see are objects. These are not random objects, but these are objects that Paul Revere used as his work. He was a silversmith. Now this is important that there are references to his occupation in this painting because it helps to position him as an everyman. He had a middle class job. So here he was as an important political figure, but he wasn't like some fancy king or aristocrat. He was like an everyday guy who, you know, was a silversmith and on the side he tried to reform America in positive ways. In addition to this, there's a sort of casualness to it. It's like casual Friday or something. He's taken off his tie, he's unbuttoned his jacket, he's pushed up his shirt sleeves. He's very casual and he's very approachable. And the way that the composition is created, it's almost as if we've kind of walked in and taken, you know, Paul Revere's surprise as he's contemplating the um, silver piece that he's working on. He shows himself as being very approachable and very accessible. This was something that people wanted in their political leaders, and this is something that Americans still want today in their political leaders. The idea that our political leaders are one of us, that they understand the challenges of everyday life, that they're approachable and that they are accessible. And we finish with 
the death of General Wolfe. This is typical of a lot of early American paintings that depict the fallen military hero, which actually has a historical precedence in ancient Greek art. You can see in ancient Greek art all sorts of sculptures that depict wounded and dying warriors. We see the same thing here. The reason why I bring this up is because it's indicating that um, classicism is starting to work its way into the American artistic conscious. And this will become fully realized shortly when we have the adoption of neoclassicism, which I'll talk about American neoclassicism in the next lecture. Here we see the death of an English soldier. He was killed in a battle where the English battled the France for control of Canada. This man, he was so brave. He uh, has been taken down in the prime of his youth. And this is an event that makes people really want to acknowledge that fact. So the British have stopped. The French have stopped. Even the Native Americans have stopped. They've laid down their weapons to come together, to collectively unify, to grieve and acknowledge the sacrifice of General Wolfe. This is interesting to me, this idea of somebody that has died fighting for a cause, for something they believe in, sounds a whole lot like a martyr. Now we've talked about martyrs in this class. What is the best way to depict a martyr? To link him to Jesus, and that's what's happening here. This is a re-articulation of the Lamentation theme. In the Lamentation theme, Jesus has been crucified, he's dead, he's taken down from the cross, he's held, traditionally it's by the Virgin Mary, he's held and people gather around to mourn his death, to pay respect uh, to him and that sort of thing. You even have like the light of God, God sort of like shining down to also lend this kind of religious or spiritual aspect to this scene. Even this guy's like praying. So there's some sort of underlying religiosity that we see in this piece. Now this type of painting is called a history painting. And this term genre that you see at the top of the screen, this is a type of painting. So genre is a type of painting. A history painting is a type of painting. Now with history painting there's a few characteristics that are very common. One is that they tend to be large in size. This painting is five feet by seven feet. That's pretty big. Large size paintings indicate power. They also indicate importance. For history painting, large scale paintings are important because it allows for the artist to include a lot of detail. And it's this idea that there's a lot of detail and that indicates that these images are historical fact. This idea that the artist is saying, oh hey, like I was there. I saw these details, I'm recording them. Even when this wasn't always the case. So that is another feature that they tend to be quite detailed. They also tend to be epic. And you get these large sweeping dramatic scenes. So in the immediate foreground we have our American reinterpretation of the lamentation. In the back though this is super epic. Battle, smoke, uh, architecture in the background, battles, naval battles, huge sky, clouds, dramatic, smoke. And that's typical as well. Now there's a hierarchy of genres, this idea that certain genres are better or more important to art history than others. History of painting ranks at the top of this hierarchy of genres. Next comes portraiture, then comes genre, which basically means also um, everyday people. Landscape is fourth, and still life is fifth. And still life, you may recall, are types of paintings that depict the arrangement of objects in space.